is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in our study of the letter of James, and I think today is our, our sixth I study. Think so. Uh, and we'll be starting in the second chapter in verse 14, as soon as I do this. Hallelujah. Father, I just I ask for your blessing on our time today. Lord God, that you would be in control of what we do with this time today. Lord, that I would not speak anything out of my mouth that you've not put into my heart. Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in this, and that we would all draw closer to you as we get into your word and learn from your Holy Spirit. So we praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. All right. As I said, we're, going to, we're in James chapter 2. Yes. And we're going to pick up today in verse 14. But I, I want to do something. Uh, it's pertinent to what we're going to look at. Okay. I know I've shared my testimony a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But hallelujah, I'm going to share my testimony until I'm not here on this planet anymore is what I'm going to do. Okay. I uh, used to be a very, very, very proud person before I got saved. And uh, I, I, I thought I was pretty hot stuff is what it was. I'm going to simplify this. But I would go out into uh, look at up in the sky on a starry night. And I would look at the moon and the stars and all of God's creation there. Not necessarily thinking of it as God's creation. But it would, it would literally depress me. Because while I could look at other people and say, well, you know, I, I have a better car than him, I have a better home than him, I better have a better. I would look up at what I saw in the sky, and I would think to myself, I'm looking at light that's come for millions of years. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's what saw at the time. And if I lived to be, this is when I was in my, my, in my youth, I mean, my youth being my early 20s and into my early 30s, that if I lived to be 50, I thought that that would be an amazing feat. So that used to depress me, truly, truly depress me. Yeah. And Alice can testify to that. I would tell him not look. Yeah, she would, because it would depress me. And then um, in 1967, Alice went to a prayer meeting. I mean, we were, we were not religious people. No, I was 67. I'm still not religious, but that's... 67 is what we got. Yeah. 76. And uh, we were, as I say, we're not really religious people. I mean, we belong to a mainline denomination, the biggest in the world, I think. And But we weren't particularly participating on a regular basis. Yeah. But she went to this prayer meeting and came back, and all she was doing was talking to me about Jesus. I wanted to tell me about Jesus. You got to know about Jesus. And I said to her, I said, listen, I, I just honestly don't want to hear that. You know, if it's if you're liking it and it's good for you, go do it. But it's not for me. So she came and she brought a Bible home. We had never had a Bible in my house, never. Never looked at a Bible. And it just so happened that on my 33rd birthday, Alice and her sister had gone out to get me a, a birthday cake. And I was sitting at my kitchen table, dining room table, having a cup of coffee, and I looked up on the refrigerator and I saw this Bible that she had brought. And I don't know what moved me, other than the Holy Spirit. And I walked over and I picked it up and I looked at the Bible and I said, oh Jesus, if you are real, I want to know about it. And I flipped open the Bible and I looked down and I saw these words. When I consider the moon and stars, the work of thy hands, and I heard a voice say to me, not only am I real, I know exactly what's in your heart. That's right. Well, I began to weep. I began to cry. I began to, and I began to, it was a challenge because I was flipping through the pages of this Bible. Like, you were having a conversation with And that's exactly what I was doing. I was having a conversation with the living God. It changed my life totally, completely, absolutely, and forever that, that day. Yes, it did. You know, I didn't. I didn't have any theology. I'd grown up on a catechism, and, and I, I knew a lot of the the rules, but I didn't know anything about the Word of God. This, to tell the truth, especially the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. That's right. 
So I started to, to devour the Bible. I mean, absolutely read it. And I, I just I couldn't get enough of it, and I loved it. So now what I'm going to do, and I, I'll tell you why that's important, is because as we get into the second chapter in the 14th verse, and let me read the 14th verse of, of James's letter. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? Well, we are saved by faith. Yes. You know, Paul said that. James says that. And there's no disagreement. They're just coming at it from two different directions. Mm -hmm. So what happened that day was that I heard the word of God. I, I heard the word of God as he spoke to me. And it caused me to believe in my heart. Yes. Well, that's the plan. You hear it? Hear it? Believe it? But then, you know, it says in Ecclesiastes that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And now it says the answer is always three. Right. There was something, something else that had to be done. I, I had heard it. I believed it. But now I needed to act upon it. Because faith without works is dead, being by itself. Our faith has to result in action, in, in some activity, right? That activity was me accepting him as my Lord and Savior. There's, you know, there's no, there should be no debate about this fact that faith, well, let me, that's a ramble here. Do you realize faith is invisible? It's invisible. Faith is invisible. Mm -hmm. Lots of people walk around saying, well, I've got faith, I've got faith, I've got faith. I, I, I can't tell, I can't see it. You know, Jesus said when he comes back, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Well, he has the ability to see into men's hearts. That's how he's going to find it. So he may search for it in men's hearts, and I, that's certainly appropriate and scriptural. Mm -hmm. But he may also look at our, what we're doing to tell. Because there has to be that connection between our faith, our confession, and our activity, our, I'll say our works. Our James works. says works. Mm -hmm. Because he says that faith without works is dead being by itself. So faith that has an activity to it, the activity is visible, and you'll it'll bear witness to the fact that the motivation comes from the faith that caused it. Right. Right? But a lot of people do activities. A lot of people give. You know, if I, if I give and it comes out of my faith and obedience to that faith, and that's an activity of my faith, praise God. Right. But some people give for other reasons. Make themselves feel good. Absolutely. And, you know, and they can give without love. Yes. And they can just give because it's the right thing to do. Or not to be too caustic or cynical, and they can be given because it's a tax deduction. Right. Well, that's true. That's true. But in, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about the fact that, that, if, he, that if he gives, if he does all of these things, and it's not motivated by love, it profits nothing. So the first thing that happens with faith is it builds the love of God in your heart. Okay, I mean, that's the first thing it's going to do. It's going to it's going to expose and build that love of God within your heart, within your life. Can faith save you? Well, you can't be saved without faith. No, you need faith. You do. That's, that's believing. It is. But it has to have action. You, you can't... A lot of people... I mean, like I said, so many people say... That they have faith. You know, it says it says in Hebrews 11 that faith is the assurance, the King James says substance, all right, of things hoped for, the conviction or evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is not something, faith is not something that you can see. But you certainly have to be able to see what it results in, what it causes. I was just thinking that, you know, <clears throat> faith will, to find out if somebody has faith, they have to be put to the test. Well, that, that's a good point, because, you know, especially in this time, as we're filming this, you know, with the COVID-19 and the, this pandemic and the economic crisis that's going on around the world, too, um, the political crisis that's going on around the world, yes. your faith has to be visible. Yes. Right? I, 
It's hard, it's hard to imagine people saying that they have faith and it's not resulting in something, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. But it can't just be in words. It's got to be in action. Yes. Okay. Do you love God? What action does that result in? What activity does that result in? You know, it's like you have to you have to believe it in your heart, you have to confess it with your mouth, and then you have to act upon it. Well, when you love somebody, you've got to tell them. You've got to tell them. And then you've got to show them. You show them how you how you love them. By serving. It's it's one of the things, you know, and this is this is very scriptural. Uh, you go check it out in Proverbs and Psalms. It's, if you love somebody, tell them. And you know, I, it doesn't wear out. No. How many times a day do I tell you that I love you? It's a gazillion times. Good. Give or take, yeah. At least, at least a gazillion times, give or take. Does he get old? No. No. How often does Jesus Christ tell you that he loves you? With every breath that you take. I was just going to say constantly. Constantly. Because he has displayed his love. He has shown us his love. We know love by this. That while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He went to the cross for us in our place. That's something that's there. I mean, it's, it, it, without that, we have no life. We have nothing without that faith. And, and faith, so many churches today, and so much of the church today is talking about what you get by faith. Well, what do you get by faith? I, you know, you, you know what I, I, I got? I, I got that salvation. The salvation was there all along, right? That was a free gift. It would just open my eyes to it, and I took it, right? Think you about to, you had to do something. Think, yeah. but think about what it says in Hebrews eleven, that faith chapter, because it says by faith Abel offered, mm -hmm. right? Right. It says by faith yeah. Noah prepared an ark. Mm -hmm. By faith Abraham obeyed. By faith Abraham offered up Isaac. By faith Moses refused Egyptian royalty, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God. See, every one of them, these great, of faith. these great heroes of the faith, and they had faith. But what the Word of God attests to is what it resulted in, what it caused them to do, what it made it possible for them to do. So faith is not so much about what you can get, other than the approval of God. It's about giving. It's about doing. Think about the Good Samaritan. I mean, this is a, this is a picture of faith. In the Bible that Jesus talked about. It's about what he did for that man. So, it's an assurance. Well, absolutely. It's, it's an absolute assurance. You know the love of God. And, and one of the problems in the church today is so many, so many Christians are walking around and they're not con they don't seem to be confident in God's love for them. Because if you're confident in God's love for you, and it's the word of God has said, you know, Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, My God shall supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He wrote to the Romans and he said, You know, God will cause all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his will. All these promises of God. And by the way, you know, it says in Scripture that not one promise that God has promised has failed to come to pass. I was just going to say that you've used the analogy of turning on a light switch. You have the assurance that you go and you flip the switch, the lights are going to come on. But but they could fail. They can fail. That's I mean there's 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 a day that you could flip it and there's nothing there. But with Jesus, it is there all the time. Well, God is He watches over His words before me, Jeremiah. He never fails. You know that just reminds me of another time. I, I got to keep telling you, Alice. Uh, Alice and I were staying in a hotel here in Central Florida because we were in between travels and we were on our way back out of the country. But this was on a Sunday and I was supposed to preach in a church in Winter Park, Florida. And I got in a, a car. I think we, I don't know, we had our car or had a rental car, whatever. I know we had our car. Yeah, we did have our car. Because we hadn't put it away yet. And I went to I went out to the parking lot of the hotel in the house and I got in the car and I turned the key and clicked. Dead battery. Dead battery. So this is on a Sunday. 
And I, was, I thought, well, I'm going to be late. And then I thought, no, no, God's, God's in control. One way or the other, it's going to work out. The thing was that my experience made me believe that when I turned that key on, the car was going to start. Yeah. Yeah. It lied. It failed. My, my experiences can fail, absolutely. But God made a promise to me. And he said, if I call you to be someplace, I'm going to get you there. And he did. And he did. So I had faith in God. I didn't have faith in the car. That's right. And by the way, that's a better thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. So how much is enough, old Bible believer? How much do you have to get from God before it's enough? You know, I, I watched, uh, years ago, I watched a, a television interview with Warren Buffett. He had been doing a conversation with uh, Bill Gates of Microsoft. Two, two extremely wealthy guys. And Warren Buffett had just made a gigantic donation to the foundation that Bill Gates and his wife had. From what I understand, it's a very good foundation. They do a lot of good works. And this reporter that was interviewing Warren Buffett was just over impressed and kept saying, you know, oh my goodness, how do you, how could you buy that was like this is one of the biggest donations ever made. Yeah. So, you know, how can you do that? She's going on and on and on. And finally, Warren Buffett just basically says, you know, stop, stop. He said, and these are his words, he said, there will be some little old lady who will go into her church this Sunday and she'll drop $5 in the, in the basket. And for her, that will be more than I've ever given. That, that really revealed his heart. Right. Because mm. he didn't give out of his need. He well, gave he, out of his blood. And that's what he said. It would be tough for him to give out of his need, wouldn't it? <laughs> but the point was, he recognized, he recognized the fact that, don't be impressed by what I gave. Because there are so many people who give more because it's a measure of what they give out of their hearts. And that's what faith is about. Faith is about giving. You have received everything. When you receive salvation, the free gift of God, what more do you need? Nothing. My God will supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I see Christians all the time and I wonder about what their faith is because they're, they're, they're anxious about what they're, going to, what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear. And Jesus said, you're anxious for nothing. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the rest will be added unto you. So, I mean, we, we talk about faith. But do we act as though we have faith? That faith is the assurance of God's love is what it is. That we know that God loves us, that God has spoken all of these promises to us, and that not one promise will fail. He watches over his word to perform it. That God will not ever, ever, ever let you down. But when we have a need, we, we only have a very small view of how that could be fixed or how that need can be oh, met. Of course. And, and you go through all the scenarios of, well, this could happen, or this could happen, or that, and none of those things will happen. It's possible that his ways are not our Always ways. his ways are not our, our ways. ways. <laughs> and that's what we have to, we have to understand. That God, and you know what? God may not do what we want. Exactly. Yeah. Faith gives us the power for us to do what he wants. Not the other way around. Because, you know, his ways are perfect, and he, he has a plan. He says, I know the plan I have for you. And his plan is a plan for life. But it may not be the kind of thing that you typically want. I mean, look at the apostles. How many of the apostles had a nice, soft, easy, soft life after they accepted Jesus? You know what they have? They have eternal life and glory right now. Sounds pretty good to me. So, and remember that there's a difference between faith and positive thinking. Yes. Positive thinking is about what you can dream up and think about and hope that it happens. Or the teaching of positive thinking is that if you think about it enough and strong enough and confess it enough, it's got to happen. It doesn't. Not at all. God is the only one that has that creative power of the mouth that he can. And if it's God's will, that's the major part. Well, how dangerous would it be for you to get what God is not God's will? And that happens, by the way. Yes, it does. I mean, the, the great example of that was at Ramah and Samuel. 
where they, the people of Israel came to Samuel the prophet. And that's when the land was uh, governed, I'll say, by the prophets, by the word of God. But the people said, give us a king so that we can be like the other nations. We want to be like the world. And God said, okay, that's what you want. I'll give it to you. And then he said, and here's what it's going to be like. You want to know what he said? You, you, you can go and look it up. Or you can just look in the news and you'll see what it's like. Absolutely. Because we have a world ruled by the evil one. And this is what the people wanted. And because Samuel was upset about it. But God said, hey, don't you be upset about it. They've not rejected you. They rejected me as being king Amen. over them. As much of the church today is still rejecting God as being king over them. Kings are jealous, by the way. Our God, one of the names of God is a jealous God. Uh, you, you can say all day long that it's, you know, you're picking this politician or that politician, but God's a jealous God. He's the only one in charge. He's the only one in charge of my life. And it doesn't matter who it is because he appoints them. So it'll be the one that he wants for his purpose. So the greatest example I can think of of, of positive thinking is Satan. Yes. You know, the, 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 the conversation that happened in Isaiah 14 when he said, this is, you know, says the king of Isaiah is talking about Satan. I will ascend to heaven. I will. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Of course, then God said, Nevertheless, you will be thrown down, thrust down the shoal to the recesses of the pits. You're not in charge. Satan's not in charge. God is in charge. If you are submitted to him and give him control of your life, you'll be blessed. You will absolutely be blessed. So, faith is one of the big things that I, I wanted to get into, but we're not going to have time now. I mean, was it Martin Luther? And remember that Martin Luther, I don't know if you know your history about this, and it would, if you don't, it would be worth your while to go study it, look it up and study it. Because at the time, it was basically only the Roman Catholic Church and Christianity. And they were absolutely ruled by works. Yes. Still are, as a matter of fact, but that's another story. And Martin Luther who was a, a theologian and a teacher, a professor at the Wittenberg College, uh, he, he started to do a study in the letter of Romans. And God opened his eyes. And he said that faith and faith alone is what leads to salvation. Not dropping money in the poor box, not going to church enough times, not, the only thing that can save you is faith in the work of Jesus Christ. All right. He may have stopped a little short. Yes. Having, well, this is this is enough a long time ago, and that was the only thing that he knew. But the fact of the matter is that's an absolute truth. The only thing that can save you is the work that Jesus Christ did. There is no work that you can do to earn your salvation. It's the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The work that you have to do is to receive it. And then what you should be doing is living it. Like I say, you've got to believe it in your heart. You've got to receive it. You've got to, believe, you've got to hear it. That's right. I mean, this is what it says. How, you know, how will they hear? Unless, yeah. unless they it's preached. Unless they how, how will they be saved? Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How will they call upon the name of the Lord if it's not heard? And how will they hear if it's not preached? And how will it be preached if somebody is not sent? We need, to, we need to have that passion to reach the lost with the word of God. Not with how great our churches are, not how great our denomination is, not about the programs we're running, not about the children's what The only thing you want to tell people is how great a God you have. Well, truly, because, you know, he's a jealous guy, and he will not share his glory with another. I talked about the fact that, you know, what, what, what started my path of salvation and, and brought me to that, right, that day was looking at the moon and the stars. And I was preaching one time at a church, and I shared that. I mean, I was sharing that, and I was saying, you know, it was the, I, I looked up, it was the moon and the stars and the sun that, that saved me. And as I had heard that voice the first time, I heard that voice again now. And that voice said to me, and still small voice that I know so well, while I was preaching, said to me, you're wrong. 
And I said, wait a minute. So I stopped and I said to the congregation, you have to give me a minute. And I turned around and I said, what do you mean, Lord, that I'm wrong? He said it wasn't the moon and the stars. He said it was my glory that saved you. Because the heavens declare the glory of God. That's where faith should lead you, is to see God in everything. So, Father, we do. We, we, desire, we desire to live this life as you require. The righteous shall live by faith. We want to live guided by your word, bringing glory to your Son, proclaiming your goodness and your love, Father. We want to be that people of faith that honor you in all that we do. Lord, help us to, to learn. Help us to receive. And help us, Lord God, not only to hear, help us to obey. Help us to act upon what you have said every day, every way. Help us to be that people that you have called. Amen. So that's right, went a little quickly. Until next week. May the Lord our God bless you to bits, and he will. All you have to do is receive him and obey him. Hear and obey him and walk in the blessings of God. Amen. For his glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, till next week. God bless you and goodbye. <laughs>